All right, so as you can tell, um, I'm going to be talking about Twitter and defamation law. Um, and I don't have my name on my title slide, which is why I've let this one sit here for a little bit longer. Um, so this is my title slide without my name, but it's still about Twitter defamation law. <laughs> um, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with defamation law, I wasn't when I first started my project either. Um, defamation refers to statements that cause undue damage to a person's reputation. Um, so for example, if you say something mean about somebody, but that mean thing is actually accurate, um, that's not defamation because it's true. Um, defamation is more like lying about saying that somebody did something terrible to make people think that they are a terrible person, for a hypothetical example. Um, so when I initially started this project, um, I wanted to look specifically about uh, at two different uh, forms of defamation. Um, in law, they are separated into libel and slander. Um, slander is traditionally seen as spoken word uh, defamation, and libel is seen as, or generally treated as written defamation. Um, and ultimately, uh, that turned out to not really bear fruit the way I wanted it to. Um, but some of the, the important parts uh, that I have got from that research are that the differentiation between them generally it implies um, a consideration of three different things, which are scope, permanence, and intent. Uh, so when you're t looking at um, a statement that causes harm to someone's reputation, uh, three of the elements that can help you determine how harmful uh, that statement was are these three things. So scope, referring specifically to how wide an audience, uh, how much exposure that statement got. So if you said something mean in your backyard to your friend, who is the only other person on the planet who heard it, not so harmful. Um, whereas if you said it in a speech with hundreds of thousands of people listening to you, significantly more damaging to that person's reputation. Uh, permanence refers to how, whether, again, sort of how th it's disseminated. Um, so if it's a, on a pamphlet, for example, um, that pamphlet can be passed around from person to person. Um, it can be seen by many different people. Whereas if you say something out loud, it evaporates into thin air, hypothetically anyway. Um, this is at least the traditional uh, look at the difference between sl uh, slander and libel, which, as I'm sure you can suspect by my use of Twitter, is a little less relevant today. Uh, but that is the issue of permanence of whether that statement endures uh, beyond the moment when it's spoken or written. Um, and then intent has a little bit to do with both of those things. They're all sort of intermingled. Um, but intent has to do with whether you specifically constructed the statement to cause undue harm to that person's reputation. Um, if you knew that it was not true, then that has a more malicious intent than if you thought that you were telling the truth and it turns out that you had bad information. Um, so those are a little bit uh, folded into the way that you uh, consider whether the statement was ultimately trying to cause harm to somebody or an incidental harm, um, and ultimately you're looking at how responsible you want to hold the person speaking uh, for what they've said. So why Twitter? Um, so I talked about Twitter because um, it basically ends up having an interesting interplay of those three elements. Uh, so obviously the internet in general has caused a lot of problems in talking about written versus spoken. Um, the internet is technically written, but it has a lot of different elements that don't resemble traditional publication. Um, unfortunately, the internet is enormous, and I only had a finite amount of time to do this project. Um, so I chose to spe uh, specifically focus on Twitter. Um, one convenient factor is it was founded in 2006, so it's a lot newer, there's a lot less information on it, which means that all the information I produced is obviously valuable. Um, so, uh, but some of the reasons that Twitter was interesting to me, um, it is used in a very casual context. Uh, people who, for example, follow me on Twitter, a lot of things that you write, uh, you basically say the way that you might text somebody. Um, in fact, I have copy and pasted texts into Twitter because I want everyone to know how funny I am. So casual context, um, ultimately you're using Twitter kind of off the cuff. A lot of people use it. It's called a, a microblogging site, for those of you who don't actually already know what it is. Um, but ultimately, you're encouraged to say a random sentence that pops into your head, something that occurs to you in the moment. Um, you're encouraged to share that. Uh, so there is sort of generally a benign intention um, of you might be thinking, oh, this is something funny that I could say, uh, without necess it necessarily occurring to you that you should perhaps fact check yourself, um, which we'll get into in a little bit. Of course, not all Twitter uh, uses are of with benign intent. Um, obviously, you can use Twitter maliciously. Um, but there is a higher probability um, of users just trying to say something that they think is funny rather than uh, specifically seeking out to damage someone's reputation or really affect it in any way. Uh, also, the wide audience is an important factor here. Um, Twitter is often referred to as a bullhorn. You literally want people you've never heard of to follow you and think that you're funny without you ever actually interacting with them. Twitter is basically trying to get as many strangers as possible to read what you say. Um, not to mention that sharing is also encouraged. So if I have 50 people listening to what I say, um, and one of those 50 people thinks that what I say is really great, uh, they can click one button, and then all 50 people who think they're great will think that I'm great as well. Um, so ultimately, whatever you say can be shared infinitely in almost a, an exponential effect, uh, where more and more people see what you said, whether you want them to or not. Um, so the other element there is unless you protect your Twitter account, which you can do but is not necessarily often done, um, 
people can share whatever you say. Um, and it's still attached to your name, and it's just posted to more and more people. So it grows. Ultimately, all of those things together uh, create a massive potential for damages to reputation. Uh, so my methodology, um, I looked at uh, different cases that exist both in the US and globally. Um, like I said, Twitter is pretty young. So there's not actually a whole lot of cases out there, particularly not cases that have been resolved. Um, or at least cases that have been publicly resolved. Um, so there was kind of only a few cases for me to really comb through, um, which is kind of convenient when you're doing a project. Um, so I was specifically looking at how uh, defamation was applied to Twitter, if the context of Twitter was specifically referred to in the cases, um, whether there was any discussion of those, ma those potential damages and the issue of uh, user responsibility, whether those actually showed up. Um, then I looked at uh, the efficacy of current applications, whether those applications in the cases uh, dealt with what I was concerned about with Twitter or whether they glossed over it. Um, and then also to look a little bit about what that says about what might happen in the future, um, especially as Twitter's popularity is, has recently only been growing. Obviously, it's the internet, so who knows what will happen tomorrow. Uh, for purposes of this relatively short discussion, I'm choosing my favorite case study, which is uh, Don Simaranker versus Courtney Love. Um, anybody who's seen Courtney Love on any social media, she loves to use them a lot, loudly, generally, with a lot of profanity. Um, so these concerned um, alleged libelous statements uh, by Courtney Love. Uh, basically, they had a business arrangement um, that Courtney Love suddenly decided she didn't really like that much, um, and that perpetuated her posting a long, very prolific rant across three different media sites. Um, two of those were social media, one was MySpace, one was Twitter which is why it's here. Um, and the other one was Etsy, which is an online uh, store, essentially. Um, she posted comments on the store to basically dissuade people from using uh, Don Ranker's business. Um, this uh, case began in 2009. Um, it was settled in 2011 for $430,000 plus interest, for those of you who are keeping score. Um, and here's just a few wonderful examples of Courtney Love on the internet being responsible and honest and everything. Um, ultimately, uh, the main issues here were she specifically accused um, Don Simranker of various crimes. Um, basically, your basic character assassination stuff. There's drugs, violence, etc. All of them are covered very thoroughly in her Twitter and her MySpace and the Etsy comments. Um, what's really fun is that she made, went out of her way to cross-post a lot of this uh, onto different websites. So these are just some of the examples. Um, if you want to know more, you can look up uh, the actual original brief has like six pages of this wonderful wonderful writing. Um, and then this is an example of what she posted on Etsy. Um, so this is actually on Don Samarinker's actual store um, where their original business relationship began, um, basically literally telling people, do not buy from her. Um, so that was ultimately a big part of the case was uh, the argument that this was specifically to cause a uh, cost to Don Samarinker's business and to essentially assassinate her character, um, as they say in the movies, character assassination. Uh, but all of this ultimately uh, obviously did not go well for Courtney Love, who shelled out $400,000 to make it go away. Um, for the record, they are now friends again, I guess. Um, she, w <laughs> yeah, so that's, so that was a surprise. Um, but yeah, also Courtney Love still posts like this on the internet, so she's fun to follow. Um, so I also looked at a couple of other cases. I'm not going to go through all of them now because of time and also because you can't compete with Courtney Love on, on the internet. It's, it's impossible. Um, but ultimately, so what are the consequences of what I'm talking about? Like, what does this have to do with our society and how we, how we're looking at the future. Um, ultimately, the reason that this was interesting to me and this did bear fruit um, is that as communication can you, continues to change with things like the internet, Twitter really has only been around for eight years, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, but we have to discuss what this is going to mean for responsibility and for fairness. Um, ultimately, what we're talking about here is that we're holding users responsible for what they post, but we're not teaching them how to post responsibly. Uh, so people who use Twitter, I mean, many people in this room I imagine use it, I know I do. Um, you're not actually taught anything about things like defamation and the things that can happen if you say something without really thinking it through or without having proof, or you say something to one person and they repost it and they quote you, things like that. Um, there really aren't any re resources uh, specifically through the media that will teach you about it. Um, so I actually did discover a couple of handbooks that have been written about how to use the internet without getting sued and other hilarious titles. Um, but 
If you look on Twitter itself, uh, they actually have zero resources for things like defamation. Um, it's, they don't even have a links page with res links to other resources. Um, so ultimately, they're assuming that users know how to post responsibly, which is kind of hilarious. Um, and so really, users are responsible, ultimately, for what they post. Twitter didn't have anything to do with any of the cases that I, that I looked at, as far as the company uh, didn't step in, didn't say anything on their behalf or against them. Um, but they do have limited conceptions of what that responsibility means. And my real question here uh, that was begged by my con uh, conclusions is whether the responsibility is actually valuable when ultimately in some ways you're just endangering users um, at their own cost and you're basically just exculpating the service providers. Is that really something that we want to happen? Obviously you should be responsible for things that you say on the internet, but isn't there a line where we should probably tell people how to say things on the internet without getting in trouble and without causing undue harm to other people? It seems basically like solving the uh, results rather than preventing the problem. Um, ultimately, what was interesting was that none of the cases that I looked at actually specifically talked about Twitter as a problem um, or even as a potential problem. Only a couple of them even talked about the reach of Twitter and how they hadn't actually intended to cause harm to the person whose uh, reputation was harmed. Um, and because it, never, it didn't even come up in case law, it's seems unlikely to me that the law itself will actually specifically address um, even user protections in general. This doesn't seem to be a largely discussed issue considering my limited lit review. Um, this is one of the only papers that really talks about it. Uh, but until something like that happens, users are going to remain responsible for their posts and for the consequences of those posts, which means that the person whose reputation you harm is going to sue you, not Twitter. Um, and Twitter's not going to tell you about that until it happens to you. Or you read about courting lava on the internet. So that's it. If you have any questions, I think I still have extra time. Yeah, you have like three and a half minutes. Woo! So if anybody has questions. So do you think it is Twitter's responsibility to provide people that like, information on how to post responsibly? Honestly, I'm not sure if people would read it, but it did seem a little skeevy that they didn't even provide it, um, even just to cover their own bases. The user agreement tells you that you're responsible for what you post, but it doesn't tell you anything about how you could post responsibly, which was really what was interesting to me. Especially since Twitter does encourage you to post everything that pops into your little head. Uh, there actually is an interesting case that I didn't have time to include, um, but it was a British case, actually. Um, again, um, the plaintiff, Lord McAlpine, um, was actually basically widely defamed in like a media frenzy um, on Twitter where people were speculating about whether he was the perpetrator of a horrible crime. Um, and it turns out he wasn't, but he doesn't really understand the internet. And initially, he was actually going to sue every individual person who tweeted or retweeted it. So he was, he, his lawyers literally had a list of 10,000 plus people um, and he was going to go after the smaller people who was going to have them like give a five pound donation to a charity. But it was still like for a few minutes, like the internet was pretty concerned about what this actually meant for user responsibility. It's almost too bad that, that he eventually dropped those lower suits and only pursued the like high celebrity people who had more influence. Um, but it did cause kind of an interesting discussion of like, is every Joe Schmo who retweets this random celebrity expected to fact check them? Like what kind of responsibility is that put on the user? Um, but since that didn't go to court, I mean, there's so many questions that happen that don't end up getting answered. Do you think that um, celebrities or people that do have a, a real big platform, do you think they um, should have a, a, a higher duty to know the consequences of their, um, of their posts? And if that's the case, would Twitter have a duty to necessarily inform them of that, or should they know that independently? I mean, to be a little glib, it seems like they can at least afford to be careless on Twitter, because they can afford $430,000 in damages. Um, not to mention, Courtney Love still pulls stuff like this. I don't really know why, because like, clearly this didn't work out for well for her. Um, it's also interesting because so many cele like celebrities do each individually use social media so very differently. Like a lot of them just promote themselves and don't really do anything else. Um, and honestly, there aren't a ton of them that do wild speculation as a matter of course. Um, ultimately, like speculating about whether somebody perpetrated a crime isn't like a common thing that you use Twitter for, um, which almost makes it worse because then when that does happen, people are like, "What do you mean I can get in trouble for this?" Which is kind of the internet in general, but. <laughs> um, isn't it perfectly appropriate to charge people with responsibility for statements that they make online that might be 
defamatory that are false and harmful to someone's reputation, shouldn't we as a society be moving toward individual responsibility rather than saying, ah, it's not true, who cares? <laughs> Ultimately, yes. Um, my real issue here is just that there isn't a discussion about it. Um, what I found really concerning was that, like, in all of the months of research I did, I found so few people actually asking these questions, especially when we talk a lot about citizen journalism um, and having random people um, take it upon themselves to try to spread information. What happens when that information isn't accurate? Because you're not talking about people who are trained journalists who are taught about doing fact checking and having three sources and things like that, um, and whether we want that standard to start to erode as we let more and more people do things like using Twitter to share actual information or things purporting to be accurate information. Um, so I think it has more to do with the lack of discussion. I do think that Courtney Love absolutely should have paid $430,000. I don't think that that was really a bad. Um, it's more just the issue that this is not discussed in our society as a society that uses the internet quite a lot.